everyone for coming, and we apologize for the delay in getting started. Uh, but we know that you're all excited to be here. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to CSIS. Good afternoon. My name is Janet Fleischman. I'm a senior associate with the CSIS Global Health Policy Center. It's our great pleasure and honor to have Dr. Dlamini Zuma here with us today. As many of you know, Dr. Zuma, Dr. Dlamini Zuma is the chairperson of the African Union Commission since her election in July 2012. She is the first woman to lead the AU or its predecessor, the OAU. So it is particularly uh, exciting that she is here to talk with us today about the issues of women, de women's development and empowerment in Africa. She has had a very impressive career. As a medical student at the University of Natal in the 1970s, she became an active underground member of the ANC and then the deputy president of the South African Students' Organization. She fled into exile in 1976 and completed her medical studies at the University of Bristol in the UK. After the historic 1994 elections in South Africa, Dr. Dlamini Zuma was appointed by President Nelson Mandela to be Minister of Health, and then in 1999 by President Thabo Mbeki to be Foreign Minister, and then in 2009 she was appointed to be Minister of Home Affairs. This has been a very important time under her tenure at, at, during her tenure at the AU. Some of the most urgent issues that the world has been confronting have been taking place from the mobilization of more than 800 medical workers from across Africa to respond to the Ebola crisis, to peacekeeping missions, including in Somalia and Darfur, to the new African Centers for Disease Response and Prevention, the MOU of which was just signed today with Secretary John Kerry. And then the excitement around the AU's plans for development for the next 50 years the Agenda 2063, which I'm sure we'll hear more about today. But especially noteworthy is the AU theme for 2015, which is women's empowerment and development. This demonstrates that the chairperson has succeeded in putting women's empowerment at the forefront of Africa's political agenda, recognizing that women's empowerment and development is not only critical for its own, in its own right, but it is essential for the development of the continent. Chairperson Lamini Zuma has often spoken of her desire to retire the hand hoe to the Museum of History. And as she steps forward as a champion of women's empowerment and development, we can see that she's also referring to retiring the discriminatory attitudes and abuses faced by millions of women and girls in Africa. These issues have never been more challenging or more important. Tomorrow marks one year since the abduction of the schoolgirls in Nigeria, starkly underscoring that the health, education, and empowerment of women and girls in Africa is essential for peace and development on the continent, and that promoting gender equality and advancing the status of women and girls around the world remains one of the greatest unmet challenges of our time, one that is vital to achieving the foreign policy objectives of the United States as well as of the African Union. So I present to you Dr. Dlamini Zuma. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm so honored, esteemed ladies and gentlemen, to address this forum about an issue that is so critical for human development and for building a just world. 20 years ago, women from all over the world, from all walks of life, gathered in Beijing and adopted a platform of action to accelerate gender equality everywhere. This year, we celebrate two decades of that event. Women across the world are taking stock of what has happened during that 20 years. There is no question that we have made some progress on women's rights as human rights, access to basic services, women's legal position and rights, and reproductive health, and many other areas. But across the world, also following Beijing, women and progressive men 
have mobilized and organized amended constitutions and introduced laws in order to take the platform of action forward. We have pushed to increase women's representation in boardrooms, in parliament, in cabinets, professions, security forces, judiciary, and management through advocacy. We have pushed quotas and legislation towards gender equality. A number of countries for the first time in history have women heads of state, prime ministers, and Nigeria uh, has just appointed the first woman governor. There is great awareness of girls and women's rights and protection against domestic and sexual violence, as well as violence in conflicts. However, despite all these advances, the pace of change has been too slow. Globalization has seen greater inequality and feminization of poverty. As we all know, more than 70% of the poor are women. And although women make up half, more than half the population of the world, and maybe I may add and produce the other half, <laughs> We are still less than a quarter of the world's legislative. Women's unpaid domestic work and community labor still remain unrecognized in accounts of GDPs. And, and equal pay for equal work is still painfully elusive in some countries. I don't know about here. <laughs> <laughs> The gender gap index estimates that if we continue on the same pace, it will take us at least 80 years to have equality. But I'm quite sure we all agree that we cannot wait for 80 years. Um, so it means that we must accelerate the pace whilst we celebrate the achievements, but we must really focus our discussion on how we can speed up change. It is for this reason that Africa's own development aspirations have necessitated that we declare this year as the year of women's empowerment and development. And this was very important because we just adopted our Agenda 2063, which is our 50 year a framework for development for Africa. And we want to transform and integrate um, Africa so that in the shortest possible time, we can have shared prosperity, we can have peace, and have a people-centered Africa that plays um, its role in the world. And so we decided that we don't want 10, 20 years down the line to say, but what about women in this agenda? We wanted to ensure that women are part of this agenda from day one. <clears throat> and then key to this empowerment of women and girls, we're making sure that their, right, their rights are central in the implementation of Agenda 2063, from education to health, to participation in infrastructure development, in manufacturing, in mining. As we develop our blue and green economies, we must make sure that women are part of that. In addition, it's very important that women have access to energy and clean water. Now, it may not make sense, too much sense to some of you, because you take those things for granted. But in Africa, many women still have to walk for long distances to get clean water, to get water, not necessarily clean, and to look for fuel, firewood, uh, so energy, access to energy and water are not just a developmental issue, but they are a very central gender issue because women once they have access to these things, they are able to have time for more productive work. 
And of course, also access to sanitation and improving family health frees women so that they can have time to study or to get employment. And Africa during this year, women is focusing on agriculture. And why agriculture? Because 70% of women in Africa are work in agriculture. So it's a very critical area if we're talking about women. And of course, as she has said, when we were um, gathering views in order to put Agenda 2063 together, the women farmers said to us one of the things they want is that the home must be banished to the agricultural museum. It breaks their back. It makes them look 60 when they are 40. And it just has very little productivity. Anyway, it adds very little productivity. So they want better technology. They want land rights. They want access to capital and extension services, infrastructure, storage. So uh, we have then decided that we have put this in Agenda 2063, but we've put it in the first 10 years of Agenda 2063. Because we think if concretely we can say in the next 10 years, no woman should be using a home. So that after 10 years, we can indeed put it in the museum. So we are looking at practical ways. What are the technologies? Things like small tillers and so on that can help women and also looking at irrigation so that they can, we can transform agriculture, make it more productive for them. But also what we found is that young people don't want to go to agriculture. But you can't blame them. What young people is going to want to go and be using that for? But if you're using better technology, we might attract them into agriculture. Because it's not sustainable that we don't have young people in agriculture. So it's also going to help in that way. We're also emphasizing in Agenda 2063 that we must invest in our people, in health, in education of both boys and girls. And we must begin to shift the focus to science, technology, engineering, and maths because those are the areas that are going to be important in economies going forward. And also in developing Africa, whether we're talking infrastructure, whether we're talking energy, we will need those skills. But we want to emphasize that those skills are not only for boys, but both boys and girls. We also feel that women and the young people are going to be the real drivers of our development. And if we leave out women, um, then I don't think we, we can achieve Agenda 2063. It's as simple as all that. We are also advocating that we must increase the number of women in parliaments and in cabinets. And that's very important because that's where laws are made. That's where policies that impact on them, on their children, on their families are made. So a critical mass of women is necessary. And we think 30% should be a start. Of course, we want to move to 50%. Um, but I must say, in Africa, only 14 countries have 30 or more percent of women in parliament. But proudly, the, the leader in the world is in Africa. Uh, Rwanda is leading the world with 63% of parliamentarians being women. So we think it can be done. If Rwanda can get up to 63%, 63.8%, why can't others get to 30% as a start? It's, so it has to be done. Women and children suffer the most when there's instability or war. And therefore, it's very important 
for us to also look at peace and stability and security on the continent. And of course, we know that if there is war, the girls lose their schooling, as we have seen some of them have, have lost their childhood and they've been taken. We don't know what's happening to them. Um, and of course, the women lose their meager assets that they have and they suffer the sexual violence. And so peace and security is very important for the well-being of women and girls and for women's um, continued empowerment. But they must also be there when peace is negotiated. They must be part of a prevention, conflict prevention. And I think we also want to raise the issue of human trafficking because it tends to be, again, women and children uh, tend to be the most that are trafficked. And I don't even know why we call it human trafficking because it's just slavery all over again as far as I'm concerned. Um, it's just modern day slavery and we need to fight and uh, really stop it and we need to work all across the world. And so, in our view, empowering women actually uh, means that more development, accelerated development, social and cultural development, uh, empowerment to families and communities. It makes social and economic sense uh, to have uh, women. Uh, and I think if we empower women, men will also benefit, families will benefit, and there probably will be more peace and more equity in the world, and indeed, a, a better world uh, will be created. So the more women are empowered, the better the world will be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for those remarks. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity to, for us to delve a little deeper into some of the issues that this presents for the African Union, for the member states, and for women and girls and men and boys across the continent. So maybe to begin, um, since you spoke about the Agenda 2063 and this theme for this year about women's empowerment and development, can you tell us in practical terms, what does that mean for the AU itself and for its member states? You mean the year for women and the empowerment of women generally? Well, for the AU, it means that our policies must clearly be, um, our policies must clearly be very gender sensitive we must ensure that in everything we do, uh, let me just use an example. Africa has neglected its blue economy. We have three times the oceanic spaces as we have land space, but we have not really uh, benefited from that. So we, are, we have decided that one of the things we must do within Agenda 2063 is to develop our blue economy um, explore our oceanic spaces and and what we have encouraged women right from the beginning to be part of that. And about a month ago, or even less, there was a first meeting of women and the blue economy uh, hosted by Angola because we, we don't want them to be left out. We want them to be part of the initial discussions. Secondly, we have started a campaign uh, to about the handheld home. So we are looking at um, replacing it 
particularly with tillers, which are manageable for small farmers. Um, and we think that, and, and they are not that expensive compared to tractors. We're appropriate tractors, but on the whole, we are looking at tillers. And we have started this campaign, and we have we want our member states to buy them. We also are raising funds for them so that, because Agenda 2063 is, we want it to be practical. We, um, in June this, this year at our summit, we're going to be discussing this theme of women's empowerment, but we are going to bring an a, a agenda index and we are going to read out who in various areas in business, in women in the economy, women in, civil in the civil service, in many areas. And we are going to look at who, how each country is doing. And this index will be uh, up updated every year so that we are able to praise those who are doing well and maybe encourage those who are not doing so well to be like the others who may be doing well. So in a practical sense, we want to, we want to do that. Um, we are also, so that will also assist us to look at if we're talking maternal mortality, these countries are doing well, what is it that they are doing better than the others so that we can share experience. Um, if we're looking at uh, women in decision making, what is it that Rwanda and the other 14 countries have done better? Uh, and how have they managed it? Have they used quotas? What have they used? For instance, we were in, Nam I was in Namibia not so long ago on the 21st of March, and Namibia had taken a decision to have SWAPO, uh, the ruling part, to have 50-50 in their list but they had not quite gotten to implementing it. But the president, before he left, he decided it has to be implemented. And people were saying, but how are you going to get this 50-50? But he came with a very simple plan that worked. He said, okay, when, because they have um, proportional representation. So he said, okay, when we uh, elect people who will go to parliament, will elect from two lists instead of one. One list will be women, the other list will be men, and we'll get 42 from each side, and that's it. And that's what they did, and suddenly they realized it's not so difficult. So I'm, I'm just saying we're looking at real practical things in each area of what to do to um, uh, advance uh, in education, particularly young women who are encouraging them to get into science and technology. So there are practical things that we are doing. For member states, uh, the way we, we've gone about Agenda 2063, we started by um, consulting with ordinary citizens. And then we, the first draft came from ideas of ordinary citizens. And that's the draft that we then gave to governments but now the, the, what the governments are going to be doing is to look at their own plans and make sure that they are in line with Agenda 2063 because that's the only way it can really be implemented. It should not be seen as a, a document that is sitting on, its, on one side and countries are going the other way. So each country, and some countries have already asked if we can assist to make sure that they put it in their national plans. So those are some of the practical things that we are doing. You talked about the practical things that can be done, but there are also things that will be requiring resources. And I wonder if there'll be resources available from the AU itself, from the member states, even from development partners or uh, private sector that might get involved in supporting any of these efforts. Yes, one of the things that we have been working on and uh, in January uh, was adopted was um, how to look at 
domestic uh, resource mobilization. First for the AU, because up to now, a lot of the funds for the AU have been coming from outside. Um, we are not saying that those funds shouldn't come from outside, but we're saying more should be mobilized from inside. So we're looking at alternate sources of funding so that countries uh, can get more resources besides what they have from their fiscals. So a whole range of areas were looked at, and there was, there was an agreement that, um, uh, for instance, all our operational costs should be borne by member states. Programs, 75% should be borne by us, and peace and security, 25% should be uh, Africans. 25% for peace and security, because really, Peace and security is the responsibility of the Security Council. But we do want to have some resources so that we can act quickly because they, we know that the Security Council takes long and sometimes they say there's no peace to keep so they can't come. For instance, if I were to use an example of Central African Republic, 2013 December, the world was saying there's going to be genocide in Central African Republic but the Security Council didn't come. It was the AU that put a, a force together to go and stabilize the situation. And then 2014, September 15, the Security Council said, yeah, now there's peace, we can come. So they came and took over uh, because there was peace to keep. <laughs> so, we, so now we want to have this 25% of our budget for peace and security so that we can move quickly because it's our people who die if the conflict rages on. And we are very proud that in Africa, even though we have conflicts, but none of them are raging on like the conflicts we see in other parts because we tend to work together to try and at least control it, not to go get out of hand, and then whilst we negotiate and do that, but we try and make sure that not so many people continue to die for years and years, as we have seen elsewhere. So we, 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 we are looking at all that. We are also looking at curbing the illicit flows of, fun, fun of, of, of resources that leave the continent. There was a study done that showed that 50 billion US dollars every year uh, leave the continent. Uh, but what was interesting was that 60% of that is corporates, 32% is uh, organized crime, and 88% is um, corruption within. So though we were all chasing corruption, which we should still chase, but it's only 8%, the 60% is from corporates, and we now have to work and ensure that over time we are able to at least uh, stamp that outflow. Maybe you could take a moment to but, talk. But also, I mean, we, we will continue getting resources from outside for those who want to assist. And we also, of course, uh, the private sector and so on, but we, we also want to, to have a bit of control over our destiny. Could you take a moment to tell us a little bit of your own experience that brought you to be so passionate about these issues of women's development, women's empowerment in Africa? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, think, I, I think if you are passionate about human beings, um, you cannot be passionate about issues of women because issues of women impact on children, they impact on families. Um, but I think it was within the African National Congress, the ANC, which is the, part, the political party that I belong to. Uh, it's, it's, it's not a political party, it's a movement. 
Uh, it was the movement that fought for freedom. And I, they had a section that dealt with women, the Women's League. Um, so I think as a young woman, I saw, uh, I had a lot of interest in what they were doing because I was a woman and all the things they were talking about were things that I was experiencing as a, as a woman. So I would say it was with, within the ANC that I really got passionate about women's issues. And they gave us space to be passionate about it. Maybe you could speak. I know there's lots of questions in the audience. And I have plenty of questions I wish I had time to ask. But maybe you could speak about some of the big challenges to moving this agenda forward and the risks for Africa if this agenda is not implemented. Well, the challenges are many. Um, of course, the first challenge is really the resources. Um, and as I say, we are trying our best to um, deal with them. The second one is human resources. Because if, if we don't develop our own capacity to implement, then who is going to implement? So that's the second challenge. And it's a risk, but it's something that we have prioritized um, that the skilling of our young people is going to be critical. Of course, we are hoping also that some of the skilled uh, people of African descent and the diaspora can also come and help. But that's, that's a big challenge that we're looking at. Already we have a team that's looking at what capacities are going to be necessary so that, and we are beginning to look at how we can um, increase those capacities, including using technology and so on. Um, of course, the third risk is also a peace. Um, and of course, the issue of terrorism that we see, uh, it's, a, it's a big challenge and a risk, but as I say, we are trying our best to, to do something about it. Um, but we also know that our population is the youngest in the world. We are the, a young continent. And we are going to continue being a young continent into 2050. We are going to still be the youngest continent. And so it means we have plenty of the precious resource that is needed. If we invest in it, that would be um, how we can get the agenda forward. But the big risk, if we don't, uh, the young people are not going to sit and starve or look at the rest of the world developing. They are going to actually um, be restless, and so it's, it's, it's very important that we, we do achieve the Agenda 2063 for, so that indeed our people, especially the young people, uh, can have uh, jobs, can create jobs, can be innovative, can develop to their full potential. Um, and of course, if we don't uh, achieve Agenda 2063, it means we won't have enough food to feed ourselves, and that's a big risk. So I don't think we have a choice but to achieve it. And empowering women. That's how women. we look at it, and empower women. Obviously, they are going to be, they are more than 50% of the population. So if we don't empower them, it means we'll be working at half capacity. So critical for the development and the future of Africa. Yep. Well, let's take a few questions. Um, I'm going to ask that you uh, will take maybe three at a time. 
I'm going to ask that you identify yourself um, and ask one question. Uh, and then we'll be coming around with the microphone so you can identify yourself. So let's start, um, let's start over here with the first one. Thank you very much. My name is Sophia Pal from South Sudan. Um, I am very pleased to, to be part of this uh, symposium. Um, you know what has happened in my country. You have talked about peace and security as a topic. I'm a survivor, an eyewitness of what has happened in my country. I took to upon myself to really advocate and work very hard for peace to be a reality in my country. As a woman and as I, an I, I, icon uh, in African continent and a leader, we have been looking at you as a motivating factor for us women from Africa. Of late, there was a, a report, a leak report, about the root causes of the conflict. Somehow, that report seems not to be the right one. We, the victims, we want to know what has happened in my country. Thank you very much. OK, now we're going to go to the other side, over here. Hi, my name is Jackie O'Neill. I'm the director of the Institute for Inclusive Security, and we focus on women's inclusion and peace negotiations around the world. So I want to thank you for elevating this topic and speaking about it here in DC and at CSIS. Um, you were the first uh, head of the African Union to appoint a special envoy for women, peace, and security. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the f where women, peace, and security fits in Agenda 2063. Um, I learned just this morning that I think the 50th country in the world to develop a national action plan is Mali. Um, and I'm wondering if, in your experience, national action plans on women, peace, and security are important for member states to have, and if you've noticed any difference um, in the conduct of countries that have them versus some that don't. Thank you. And we'll take one more question, and then we'll give <coughs> Madam Chairperson a chance to respond over here. Hello, my name is Carolyn Tackett. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm with the Public International Law and Policy Group. Um, I just sort of on the same note as these first two questions, I'd like to ask, what do you see as sort of the best practices and maybe opportunities for the African Union and other members of the international community to support women on the ground who are actively trying to involve themselves in these peace negotiations and uh, conflict prevention processes? Um, what, you know, how, can, how can we support those women who are taking on those initiatives? Thank you. Okay, so three questions related to peace and security? Okay, starting with South Sudan, um, we commissioned a, 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 an inquiry uh, led by former President Obasanjo he, and, he, and his team. And in the team, we included our special envoy on uh, gender and women in conflict but we also included um, other women. The report was completed and was give, given to us as the commission. We had been asked by Peace and Security to, to commission this. So we gave back the report to them at the summit in January. And at the time, as you may know, the two parties had been meeting in Arusha trying to reunite, and they had reached certain agreements. And now they were taking those agreements into the peace negotiations. And at the time, it looked to the negotiators as though they are just about to clinch a deal. And so the chair of IGAD felt that, and supported by others, that the report must come after they'd just finished that part of negotiations. 
And so the report is there, the peace and security, we'll discuss it um, probably definitely in July, they may discuss it even in June at the summit, but they may discuss it even earlier. But it's ready, it's there, and none of us um, want impunity. So yes, negotiations, yes, reconciliation, but also accountability and justice. And then the, the special envoy and the role of women. I think women are very important. Maybe I'll just talk about my own experience. Uh, when in the 90s, there was a lot of violence in South Africa, political violence, especially in the province where I come from, in Guazulu Natal. And at a point in time, women, we decided as women from both parties to come together and to say, for us, this is enough from both sides. And I think those discussions between the IFP women and the ANC and them pushing their sides to stop the violence, to come to an agreement, um, I think it assisted a lot because once the IFP women themselves felt that they, they want peace, they don't want any more of this violence, we, we were able to work with them. Because sometimes we forget as women that there is a lot in common amongst us out besides that we are in different political parties, but there is a lot in common that we can do together as women, irrespective from any, other, any party. But even when the Constitution was being uh, drawn, we came together and formed women's coalition from different parties, from civil society, from religious, and said these are the things as women that we want in the Constitution, irrespective of where we come from. So I think the role of women sometimes is underestimated, and we ourselves underestimate the role we can play. And I think, and that's why we felt that it's important to have a special envoy that's looking specifically, because she's able to go and meet women, and women are able to tell her things sometimes that they are unable to tell to men and she's able to organize them and, sh and share experiences with them and bring some from different countries and so on. So we think that it, it, it's a very important, and of course, action plans are, are important as long as women are, are the integral part of drawing them and as long as they are implemented. And of course, there is a lot of things we can, you can do to help the women on the ground. Um, first, just sharing experience with them, discussing with them, also giving them some resources. Usually it's not even a lot that they need to organize themselves. Um, so I think there is a lot that can be done, and those who are in conflict, uh, some of them have even lost all their possession, so small things can also assist them and the children to go to school. So there's a whole range of things that can be done, um, from starting from just sharing experience to having workshops with them or just discussions with them to assisting them concretely. And, and also, it's important for women, even post-conflict, to be able to get engaged in, in, in income-generating activities and businesses, even if they are small, to start with, not that they should be small forever. Um, because also economic some degree of economic independence is very important uh, to, to the women in these situations. 
Why don't we take another round of questions? Maybe we'll hear from some of the men this time. Uh, thank you very much, Madam uh, Chairman. My name is Garang Binga Kong, Ambassador of the Republic of South Sudan. Uh, Madam Chair, first let me congratulate you again for gaining the, conf the confidence of the continent, uh, being appointed as the chairperson of AU. I know how difficult it was because I was there as part of the delegation of the Republic of South Sudan. And how many rounds did you compete with the man to beat him at last? <laughs> so I'm happy for you. Let me congratulate you again. I have a question and a comment. Uh, the first question, the, the question is uh, that you talk about the empowering women in the area of agriculture. And we know that in Africa and elsewhere, there's the issue of access to land for women. How do you address this issue with the, our embedded traditions that men are uh, the owners of the land? So access to the land for women. The comment I want to make is to regard of uh, what my sister Sophia uh, said there. I think when I came here, I didn't expect that this is going to be a campaign for the rebels and the government. And I know uh, sister Sophia, she was a member of parliament, and I was a member of parliament. This current parliament, appointed by the president to be a member of the parliament. And she should be appreciative to the president that appointed her to be a member of parliament. And her seat is still there vacant. I was elected member of parliament and then given this assignment to come and serve. I don't think that she's a survivor because she left from Juba airport with her child in her hand, boarded a plane to Nairobi. If the government wanted to kill her, the government could have snatched her from the airport and killed her. How can you say that you are a survivor when you left uh, through, the, pass, through the, 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 the airport? Mr. So let's stop uh, telling lies. I just want to respond to this. Thank you. All right. In the back. Excellency, thank you very much. I was going to bring, uh, my name is Nia Kwete. I was actually coming with um, a young graduate student um, born in Africa who's here, but the schedule changed, so she asked me to ask a question. Um, that are you going to be the Mrs. Clinton of South Africa and set an example for them? <laughs> I think, I think in the interest of time, because we started late and I, I fear that we're gonna have to wrap up fairly soon, um, maybe I'll let you answer those two questions and then we'll see, maybe someone can tell us if we have a next time for another round. Why don't we just take all of them and I answer? Yeah. Do we, all right. Doing another round. Maybe one from the youth. All right, let's do one from the youth. <laughs> Hello, my name is Simon Adeji. Um, I want to represent you because she made a comment about you not being interested in agriculture. The mic is not. Is the button? Um, I want to really address the situation of the fact that the African Union is not aware of a shift in popular culture, especially with the African youth. And as regards to agriculture, um, more, I've been to 21 African countries in the research work, having to work with young Africans, and majority are interested in agriculture, and having to speak about the part that the ambassador mentioned with land. We know that the African culture 
that majority of the land belong to a family or ends up being to the head of the family or the son. And women tend to not have the opportunity to have anything to do with that. What policy is the African Union creating for land accessible for women? Just like in Poland and in the UK, they have provision for people that are interested in agriculture, not only for the rich, because it seems like agriculture is now for the rich, and the grants are being handed over to the wealthy. So what exactly is the African Union doing as regards to that? And also, we would like to see a situation where, as regards the uh, shift in uh, uh, cultural, uh, uh, popular culture, for the African Union to play more with technology, social media, and um, music, and which are the real big factors of awareness, especially in Africa. Thank you. Okay, we'll take one last question, and then we'll allow Madam Chairperson to uh, wrap up. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rosemary Seguero. Thank you, Madam Chair, for coming again. It was nice seeing you at the African Summit you and your wonderful speech at the African Summit. My executive summary to the President Obama at the uh, African Summit was peace and security, agriculture, and women empowerment. Women cannot be empowered when we have conflicts, violence, and people who suffer more are women and young girls when they are abused. How do we empower them to what we want to 2060 or even 10 years? How do we empower them when they are being abused, especially in DRC Congo, where now young people are being children are being sexually assaulted. This is what you need to put because we believe in you, we value you, and with your leadership, you have really empowered us. And more information, Madam Chair Lady, is here. How do we partner with you? This is my letter to you. As a civil society, I was born and raised in Kenya, in the rural area. We need to get the women in the rural area, people in the rural area, communities in the rural area, be empowered. We want to partner with you. This is my letter. I'll give you today when you leave. All the time we take pictures, but this time is a letter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I'm Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm going to use the prerogative of the chair to ask one last question that you can add in, because uh, you were the Minister of Health, you are a medical doctor, and the issues of women's health, both maternal mortality, which you alluded to, but also access to family planning, access to information and services. Uh, maybe in your uh, final comments, you can address the uh, interest of the African Union and the importance of the member states to move forward in that area as well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, access to land. Yes, it's true that uh, land in Africa uh, is very difficult in terms of traditional ways, and women tend not to have access to land. But as I said earlier, that we are going to have this index, um, and there are countries which have put legislation that gives women right to land. I will just, in the interest of time, I'll just quote one. Ethiopia, where I live now as the chair, has got a law now where both men and women have access to land. If the land belongs to the man, it also belongs to his wife. And if they divorce or separate for whatever reason, they have to take half the land. And, and also, if the man dies, the land remains with the woman, whereas in the past, the land only belonged to the man. If he decided he doesn't want this woman anymore, the woman is out of the land, another woman comes. And if he dies, the family uh, uncle or somebody takes over the land. So they, they have a law that now gives women the right to land. And so in this index, we'll be specifying which countries have done what and asking them to share with the others 
how they've gone about it so that they, they, others can also do the same. So we are aware of that, but it's not, it's not all not is lost because there are countries that, that have put laws in place and we, we will be encouraging the others. And of course, we are also going to be meeting with financial institutions because it's also very well to have land, but if you have no access to finance, um, and we are already discussing with private sector, but we are going to be discussing specifically with financial institutions because both for women and youth, they, they have difficulties in accessing finance for their businesses or for agriculture. And so, so we hope that that will also encourage young people uh, because they say once they see their age and their looks, the bankers just say, I know you don't, you are too young, you don't have experience. So we want to address that. Uh, social media, yes, we, we do use social media in, in the AU. Uh, of course, we can use it more and we, we do try and follow the trends. We, we, we also got young people who are at the AU some of them are working, but some of them are intense. So it's not a, an organization of old people. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then on the question of women, women being abused. Of course, that's why we even have this envoy, special envoy. And we are working hard, we are talking, we are advocating so we can partner with you. We have no problem because it's our view that we need to advocate and to get women not to be suffering from abuse, but to be doing productive work for themselves and for their families and children. And so we will take the letter uh, happily and see what, uh, <laughs> what's in it. And women's health, Yes, in fact, we fought very hard to get uh, women's health as part of Beijing, but also the WS World uh, Sustainable Development Conference. And in the AU, our protocols uh, are also um, very much into women's health. Now it's a matter of imp implementation and well, there, there are lots of countries actually that have put programs of family planning, of reproductive rights, and so on. So we are making progress there, but we would like to make faster progress. Um, well, maybe in, the, in, the, in South Africa it's slightly different from here. Here you can just stand and declare yourself a candidate. <laughs> in South Africa, it's a bit different. Um, it, I'll talk about the ruling party because that's the one I know best. Uh, in the ruling party, you don't just declare yourself. It's the branches of the ruling party that say, we're nominating this one. And then it goes up until the national, and if at national you, you go through, then, so I can't answer that question because I'm not the one who has to declare. <laughs> okay. Any final thoughts, closing remarks? Well, it's just to, to say that um, I, I just hope that it's not only and the letter that I will get that for cooperation, but we need to, would like to network and to, uh, with women here and in Africa. And so we, we hope that indeed we can link uh, and, and have networks. We have, as the Commissioner for Trade, maybe you should stand in the AU. That's our Commissioner for Trade and Industry. We are 10 commissioners, five are women, five are men. <laughs> <laughs> and we are trying to get the 
the, the officials also were trying to get more and more women so that it, it is indeed uh, balanced and reflects the demography of the continent. Thank you. Well, we thank you so much for sharing your insights and your time with us. We look forward to continuing the, the work to work together and to see what you will be accomplishing in the years ahead and that we can work together on these issues of women's empowerment and development in Africa. So please join me in thanking. Thank you so much.